Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Ikin Salvador Amores. I'm the project leader of the, the year three museum management training. So we are now in uh, webin uh, webinar two. Uh, we had the first session with Professor Boots Herrera last time from director and chief curator of the Ateneo Art Gallery. Uh, she talked about curating exhibitions for public access through uh, the digital media. So today we are pleased to have with us Dr. Christina Wan uh, from SOAS London. Uh, Dr. Wan um, has a PhD in comparative literature from UP Diliman and as an, she used to be associate professor at the humanities department of the University of the Philippines in Cebu. She also taught uh, at UP before she moved to New York in 1996 then to London in 2013. In 2017, uh, she's she spearheaded the creation of the Philippine Studies at SOAS or PSS under the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Philippine Studies at SOAS is an interdisciplinary forum for Philippine related teaching, uh, Philippine related teaching, research and cultural production in the UK. With a training in uh, the digital humanities from the University of Leiden and the interactive tel telecommunications program of New York, uh, Dr. Wan has implemented a number of digital projects at SOAS that seek to not only provide open access to colonial archives, but also create avenues for sourcing and inscribing annotative knowledge from academic and cultural originators in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia. So uh, the ongoing project uh, is the Digital Filipiniana that started in 2018 and the Mapping Philippine Material Culture. Uh, there is also a website uh, that you can look into uh, for the material culture you know, from different repositories in the UK. and. Uh, other museums. In June 2021, she will she has been working on a knowledge base for decolonizing Southeast Asian sound archives with an H AHRC funded grant. No? Uh, so today we are pleased to have with, with us uh, Christina one, uh, which is now 3 a.m. in London, and it's 10 a.m. 10 p.m almost 11 here in Michigan. So on a different time zone, uh, we have to push this webinar now for the sake of all our uh, participants uh, for this morning in the Philippines. Christina. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so I'm going to share um, the... the um, let me just know if my content is moving so I can uh, just make sure. Um, let's see. All yes, right. Yeah. Is it moving? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ikin. Um, so uh, this morning, we are going to look into um, kind of a uh, the precedence for a virtual virtuality uh, museum virtuality. So we are uh, looking at a content management systems uh, as a precursor to creating digital exhibits you know, or online exhibits. So what I'll do basically today is just introduce briefly what we use for the mapping Philippine material culture project. Uh, called Omega, which is a, a content management system, and then introduce you to the tools that we use to create digital exhibits. Um, so if you're familiar, this is uh, one of the projects we do at Philippine Studies at SOAS. This is the Mapping Philippine Material Culture Project, which is a visual inventory, a global visual inventory of um, uh, objects or material culture from the Philippines, but stored in institutions um, outside of the Philippines. So we've um, we've mapped um, uh, a lot of different uh, countries, material culture in different countries all over the world. And this is the kind of splash page where you see kind of this uh, mapping you know, of where you can find 
Philippine mature culture and and you know uh, and then if you dig down I'll show you later uh, if you dig down you can see the the items so uh, I guess we'll be, I'll begin with a question of why establish a content management system and um, I do this because um, a, lo a lot of you might uh, I'm sure are are wanting to put together um, a kind of uh, perhaps a virtual uh, uh, or a mirror virtual museum of your maybe regional museums. Uh, but I wanted to talk briefly uh, about kind of the data, uh, kind of the online version, you know, or kind of the, the data set that you would need uh, behind it. So um, why establish a custom um, content management system? Um, I, for us, at least for the mapping site, um, we, we do this because uh, uh, a lot of the of these objects are not accessible. Um, uh, you, you, you need to get a, an appointment to go in and uh, the storage, most of these objects are in storage and museums generally don't um, exhibit Philippine objects. And some have been in storage since they were collected. So um, uh, putting them online will allow uh, people to at least have access, virtual access to these objects. So a few museums that we work with actually, um, like the Frankfurt Museum, um, this is actually the first time. And if you go to this, um, if you go to this uh, link, you'll see that this is the first time that we're actually seeing virtually the contents of the museum in Frankfurt, no? I mean, the Philippine collection in Frankfurt. Now, um, this is also true if you're building your own inventory. Um, uh, if you have a regional museum and you want people to know what you have in your collection and, you know, physical uh, visits are often hard to do, but, but just to have a, a more um, wide, just a wider reach, then you, you can mirror your inventory online. Uh, but aside from just access, um, you can um, establish clear goals when you're putting up your online database, um, because uh, uh, for for us, for example, we 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 have kind of an advocacy. Um, we want to uh, create this database for uh, a specific audience, which is uh, the source communities and Philippine scholars. So we try to create we because we have these clear goals. It's not just kind of an encyclopedic aggregation of everything, but we we do have um, we do have kind of a goal in putting up this digital access. No, and the goal is really to create a custom. Uh, um, sorry, uh, and the goal is really to create a custom knowledge base, where um, you can either share for uh, the creation of the database or addition uh, with multiple users and contributions of content. And um, especially because we're using colonial records, we have the advantage over um, very close kind of uh, institutionalized bureaucracies where it's very hard to add to something if, um, at the, on the database, for example, of the Met Museum or other big institutions. No? And when we customize your knowledge base, um, you can establish new hierarchies, for example. Uh, you can kind of create your own structures of knowledge. You can um, aggregate material and create your own statistical analysis. So in the mapping site, we have, you know, um, what are what are the different how much how much of Philippine material culture is actually on exhibit? So you can, because you have aggregated the data you can create computations, no? Like, um, uh, well, it's 99.9 .9 is not on display, for example, as we know from, at least from the data that we have aggregated, no? Uh, in, in terms of um, displaying Philippine material culture. Um, the, the very important also is that um, because you have your own database, you can interrogate and annotate um, your data, uh, or at least the data that you are, for us, um, 
the mirror the mirrored colonial archives so we can go in there and we can um, annotate the data so we it's a it's very slow work and what we do it by connecting to source communities we ask them um, and then we get um um, what they think about the object, et cetera, indigenous terms, et cetera. And then we are able to go in uh, to the tool because we have our own database and we can easily uh, create, um, you know, we can correct or we can um, interrogate certain categories of knowledge, no? Also, um, as we go along, the, the project, the mapping project was launched in 2021. Um, as we go along, we we are able to um, listen to to users, no. So, because of the growing data, because we keep adding to it, we're able to recalibrate certain features of the database. So you can, uh, for example, uh, we added a new feature on um, a lot of the people in diaspora who are actually um, able to go physically. They, for example, want to know uh, what is on view in this museum because we want to visit it and we want to know what's there so we added this new feature where if you go to the prado you can look up what's on view you know, or you know the anthropology museum etc so that in a way uh we this is a new feature and it was um kind of a, a, a resulted from kind of listening to users and uh uh recalibrating you no know? because again when you are able to customize your database, you are able to, um, um, you know, um, kind of um, recalibrate it uh, according to the users who are actually using it. Now, aside from um, these, these features, uh, we, um, because we also, you also have your data already in your database, you are able to, um, tell object stories more easily. And this is kind of the segue to digital exhibits now. Because once you have your, your inventory, your data, uh, and you have item numbers online, then it is very easy to create tours or exhibits uh, by, by um, calling into your exhibit what you already have in your inventory. So in other words, it's kind of like in WordPress, you already have an image bank, for example, and then you call it to your digital exhibit. Uh, but in a in a more kind of sophisticated way, I guess, in your database, you already have the data bank. And then when you come up with a story or a digital kind of, um, you have a theme or uh, maybe a feature, uh, you, you can easily create a tour of, of using the uh, objects that are already in your database. And then aside from that, of course, you can make use of other technologies like 3D scans, or you can put in close-ups, uh, use AI to create um, kind of relational systems. Like in your database, uh, you, with technology, you can create relational um, objects, no? And these are it, like in the mapping project, you can see what are the other different objects um, in the database that look like this or are um, have the same provenance or whatever, but you can create these relational links easily because your data is already um, online. Uh, not to mention, of course, search capabilities. You can look for, for things. You can... Um, when you do a search, then it's um, it's kind of like OCR, right? Like uh, optical uh, scanning. You can feed, uh, look for words, for example, because all of it is in um, uh, online. So, um, uh, just a, a just an example of of what I was saying about um, the kind of advantages of being able to um, annotate material. Uh, easily is um, when we look, for example, at object descriptions, um, uh, we, we do kind of um, workshops, for example, and we look at individual object descriptions. And of course, this might be different from your, your end because you are from regional museums and you're probably uh, 
uh, very carefully writing the object descriptions for each of your um, items in the inventory. Uh, but for for the mapping project, for example, there are many colonial archives that have derogatory terms and kind of um, different things. So we we look at um, you know we be, uh, in the database we insert indigenous indigenous terms. Uh, um, uh, mostly for findability, because once you recalibrate your user, you want them to find the object online, right, in your database. So um, if it just says a hat or a, a tubular skirt, um, it's it'll the the the, the I, there will be so many items that come out in the search, right? But if you put in the 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 term. Uh, the indigenous term, um, if you annotate it with the indigenous term, then somebody from that source community can more easily find objects that they are looking for. Um, and, you know, you can also um, map um, very granular ethnolinguistic groups. So instead of, for example, in colonial terms, you put Igorot, which is a huge kind of pan-regional term, um, which has a lot of baggage, although it, it has been uh, appropriated by by the source communities now. But for the database, um, because you are able to go very granular into the geographic location of a village or even or even like a like a province, then you are able to put that in and allow for find greater findability as well. And as I mentioned, um, yeah, we, we try to annotate these derogatory words, inaccurate words, um, et cetera. Uh, uh, just as an example, uh, we did um, kind of a, a, a conversation and in conversation with the Blaan uh, last year, and we were able to annotate the database uh, through the through just an interaction no, with with what they felt uh, they wanted from that database, the the Blaan group that we were working with. So this is um, the uh, Field Museum in Chicago. And one of the things when I showed this to them as an example, one of the things that they were kind of uh, very, very kind of adamant about was the uh, spelling of the word um, this, uh, this spelling you no know? so uh, a lot of them said oh is there any possibility that in the new database in the mapping database this can be changed to what the term that we actually want to use which is um uh blan you no know? with, with because to them and this has gone through congressional hearings and there's a resolution to change the spelling and this is really significant to them so because you have a customized um, content management system, you are able to annotate this. And this is exactly what we did. Uh, we changed, uh, we inserted the indigenous term and then we we corrected, um, we corrected the, um, oops, we corrected the um, the spelling uh, globally actually. And we, we were able to do this uh, in front of the elders and we, for every instance of the, the wrong spelling of Balaan, um, we were able to globally change it. And it was very um, it was very nice to see them really kind of having agency over uh, the, the database, no? or the, at least the, their content in the database. Um, aside from that, um, a lot of people also um, look at um, the, the database as like, okay, it's just digital, you know, it's virtual, can you actually return them? And I always say that um, the database can be a good baseline for, uh, for, for all sorts of things. You'll kind of uh, know where things are, for example, but also it can even be a baseline for physical repatriation because once you uh, have data that's very richly researched and you have provenance very clear provenance um you can um it can become a basis for um you know negotiations and, and sorts of things and um just very recently in april uh this is exactly what happened no? this woman billy um 
uh, came to me because of the mapping site, and she heard that we were doing this in conversation um, uh, kind of workshops with source communities. And so she contacted me and said, actually, I have um, I have a collection. I want to bring it back to the Tiboli. And can you help me do it? So we, we um, yeah, and she contacted me in February. And then we um, uh, we kind of very quickly arranged all the, the, well, she wanted to go with us because we were going there already to do digital repatriation. But then she came with us and it became such a very emotional thing, you know, but um I guess the point was that um, she wouldn't have she she couldn't have known about this this project or kind of our trying to map Filipino interior culture without the database online, no, or at least without the project. So this is just a picture. Marianne was with us, and just a picture of kind of really emotional um, when she was bringing back everything, and we were looking at the objects and kind of uh, cataloging them online. But then now it was actually physically repatriated. Uh, this is Billy, by the way, when she was um, uh, when she was in Lake Cebu in the seventies, and uh, and this is her now, and um, uh, when and we when we were there. Anyway, so how do you create a customized um, database uh, or a content management system? Many call it a knowledge base because it's not just all data, but it's actually a lot of. Um, um, you know, re uh, refinement and deep research, uh, annotation and everything. No? So um, I, we use for the mapping site, we use Omeka Classic, which is a free online tool that you can download. And we do have workshops at SOAS. We, we have workshops for those who are interested to do, um, to set up uh, uh, to set up the at least the the kind of shell for your for a database, if you are a regional museum, and then um, so you basically download Omeka Classic onto a server, um, hopefully some a server that has um, has some kind of support for Omeka, the uh, and you know putting in the plugins and things, but once you put it in in there and download so. This is now the back end of the mapping site. Now, when we say back end, it's just kind of the 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 bones, all right. So this is the admin, um, the administrative kind of um, interface, no, of the of the site. And this is the the so you will see that. All right, so we have nineteen thousand items in our inventory, um, and this is kind of the. You know, you can have users here, you can add users, and you can give them levels of access. So if you have like interns or you have people who want to help uh, volunteers, you can give like l certain levels of access. So it's not like a super user, but they can still add, no? Um, so we've actually done a lot of that. We are a lot of volunteers who we've given access to, uh, like Norman, he, he comes and finds all these things in the US and then he just adds to it. Of course, it's still private. And then he he tells me that he's added something and then I look and then I verify stuff and then I make it public. So, so you go in there and you'll see that when you click on items, you this is, you know, it's very intuitive. You can add an item, you can edit the item and these are, and you'll see that it's still a private one. So I still have to go through them and, um, you know, verify information before I make it public. But yeah, yeah you just keep adding um, into the back end. And once it becomes public, then it goes to the front end and it will show up in your, um, in your site, you know, which is called the front end or the interface. So you keep adding, you edit, um, you do all sorts of things here. So here, this is uh, one item and, and it's good also because it gives you a unique item number. So this can be your accession number uh, for, the, for the item that you've added. And then you edit and this is kind of, um, and the good thing is um, Omeka uses Dublin Core, which is an international standard for, so that you can, it can relate to other databases, um, uh, but uh, it can also, um, you can also customize it by adding, if you look here in the item types, you can add your own, no? like 
I put in, for example, indigenous term or or other things that you might want to so, so you can customize Dublin Core. Um, so um, so you you can see typical kind of um, things that you need for a descriptive uh, catalog for your inventory. So a title, your, the date it was made, and then you have the identifier. This is from the colonial. Uh, this is from the museum, the Museo Naval. This is their their identifier, but this is your own identifier if you're adding. Um, if, if, if you have a regional museum, um, then of course your identifier will, be, will probably be um, something that you have kind of devised as a as a sequence, no. And then, of course, yeah, you have location where it was made, where it's found, um, the origin, and of course, um, you can make this as granular as possible because you can easily edit and add if if you know where exactly, you know, or you could put materials, dimensions, and of course, um, the provenance is very important, especially if you want to be. Um, um, Yes, I will send you the Omega link. Um, um, so yeah, if you really want to be precise, you can add on. So that's the kind of beauty of an online database, no? So it's not like it's um, it's so it's it's more dynamic. And it's not very static, no. It's easy. You can annotate it easily. So um, now you can in Omega you can um. Add items manually one by one. No, you can um, you can add an item here one by one, or um, what we sometimes do is um, if you already have an Excel sheet with all your um, data on it, what we can do is uh, what you can do is um, you can. Um, you can do uh, uh, you can align the metadata fields that you have in your Excel sheet to align with the database on Omeka. And it uh, Omeka actually allows you to um, upload the whole thing. And it will, if you do upload it, um, it will populate everything um, very quickly. So for example, the Fields Museum gave us an Excel sheet with all their 10,000 objects or well, at least 8,000 of the ones with the photos. So they gave, and then we worked with them to align each field so that it will align with the data metadata that we have on the on Omega. And then we push the button and it uploaded. Of course, we put it as private. And so, yeah, it populated it automatically um, and it had all the descriptions, et cetera, et cetera. So I, you can see this as being very useful if you already have um, an Excel sheet with your metadata, no? And then um, um, you just need to, um, I'll send you uh, the link and also a manual for Omega Classic, no? So they can, they'll teach you how to do the metadata aligning. Um, of course, if you customize your database, then you will need other columns in there, but you can easily add uh, this to Omeka. So this is an example of a metadata sheet where you have a collection builder, no? So you have a object ID. So maybe you're familiar with this. Some of you might already have this Excel sheet. So you can... Um, uh, uh, put your object ID number here, file name. Um, uh, then you'll see that these are the metadata fields that you saw in the in the Onomeka, right? So you have title, creator, date, description, location, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Type. And so, um, um, if if you if you are um, if you have such a thing, then uh, you can follow the manual and then you can upload it to Omeka once you have established one. So now, um, well, you can ask me questions later, but um, I'll just keep going. And anyway, um, so yeah, so you have this and you populate this, however many, make sure your object IDs are unique to each item. If you have, um, a, a photo of it, you can also put this here, and when you upload it, it will automatically upload uh, as well. 
but of course you will need to um put ev all your photos in um in a in a in a file server so that it will it will link to it now once you have your inventory which is the back end no and you've uploaded everything you're annotating etc how do you present this to the public no so this is now where um you can try begin to build your front end so as i said the front end is just the public facing part of your of your database and with omeka you can create um a theme you can use a theme you can you can you know just use it out of the box there's several nice themes um we use roy i think for omeka uh, for the mapping site although we customized it a lot uh but you don't need to customize it so much if you just want to you know or you could customize it later but this just allows you to have something that the public can access and once you once you're able to access it publicly then um you know people can interact with it people can can look at it now uh, one of the really important parts, for example, of um, of the mapping site is its ability to map where things are in institutions all around the world, right? So if you look in the back end, you will need to, for example, put in your latitude and longitude of, of the, let's say, the Met Museum in New York. You put in the latitude and longitude of, of the museum. And then if you want to make a timeline, you put, so this is just the data that you need in the back end. And this is now what it will look like in the front end. So um, you, you, you can uh, look for the lat long, the, the kind of uh, the places, for example. Now, I guess for the regional museums, you, you your map, you it will depend on what you're trying to map, right? So. Uh, most likely, if you're um, a, a museum uh, uh, putting together your inventory, you will need to map where the objects came from, right? So let's say it's a village, you can, what you can do actually is go to Google Map, uh, drop a pin, and then right click, and it will give you the latitude and longitude. Um, I can show you that later, no? But it's very easy to get. Um, the latitude and longitude, and you put that in your data. And once that data is there, Omeka will create a map for you automatically. So yeah, it's it's, it's very cool actually. Um, so here, uh, so that's how, so for each of these um, dots in the map, we have put a lat long for each, each thing. So if you were to reimagine that for your own use, then it, this would probably be, you know, focused on the on the Philippines or maybe a region, make it huge, and then you could put all the different locations and then you can map it. And and yeah, if you have so um should I ask questions? I'm not sure if uh people are uh we can uh, do the questions maybe after later. the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So maybe. it's okay. <laughs> I hope um, people are uh, um, getting something out of it so far. Um, all right, so, okay, thanks for the hearts. <laughs> all right, so now, so this is just the, the front end, no? So this is kind of what they call the visualization. Okay, um, this is the visualization of your, of your data, no? Now, so one, one very important use of your data using the lat long is a map, for example. But as 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 Ikin wanted me to talk about um, kind of digital exhibits. So um, based on the data that you already have for each of the items, for in Omeka, you can uh, create tours or exhibits. You know? So these are tours or exhibits. We generally use, uh, we have exhibits and tours for us. So if you look at this um, particular, these are tours that we did. Um, um, it's kind of easy to do, um, but again, 
the assumption is that you already have the data in your as an item in your inventory, right? And then you're just going to call it. Now, this is um, the back end of a tour. And you can see that you can edit it. Um, you know, here you can edit. So, you know, if there are errors here, or you can easily change stuff like that. And then this is now public. So what would it look like? This is the back end and what is the front end? So this is what it looks like in the front. And this is an example of a digital exhibit. So um, you could, you know, put pictures in there, you can put text. Now, what is the beauty of a digital exhibit? Um, I guess um, a lot of the, a lot of the, your inventory becomes as, as always, no, it's always, it's always great to have, um, to narrativize your, your content, no, to create stories. It doesn't have to be very academic, like the, the, the words you use, et cetera, because you, you know, that your audience, you, you need to look at your audience. So most of it is like kind of bloggy kind of text, but because you are, you can call out these items, you can easily um, um, uh, point to them, no? So for example, we uh, created a map of the objects of, of Sama speaking people. So uh, using lat long. So, uh, and the, as I said, that is automatic in Omeka, no? As long as you put in the coordinates, you can uh, call, uh, so this is the exhibit, and then if, if you call the exhibit, you can directly link to the item in your inventory. So this is a male, a man's grave marker and a woman's grave marker. And, and then when you click on this, you can go to the item and learn more about each item. Okay, so that's kind of the beauty of a, of a, a, a synchronized database and a digital exhibit no? in one. So if you click on that, it will go to this one. Um, let me take, sorry. So if you clicked on, on the link there and we, you wanna learn more, then you'll see this and then you'll see kind of the, um, sorry. I, did I, or maybe it's too hard, right? I'll, sh I'll show it to you later, but. So yeah, if you if you scroll down, you'll see kind of what I what research has been done on this man's grave marker. Um, out um, in addition to the digital exhibit that you have already made, right? So you can link to all of these items in your inventory. So it makes it easy. And and so for example, here underneath the the digital exhibit, you you have a tour, right? So you have if you click on this, you will go to that item, the man's grave, uh, grave marker, the woman's the grave marker, etc. And this is all automatic in Omeka. No, you just add each of the links at the bottom, and then the people can can take a tour using this while reading your text or after reading your text, and they can just kind of keep going, right? So that's very cool. Um, this is another example of a, of a digital exhibit we did of um, a bamboo tube that we, we found in Bologna. Um, it was really very amazing uh, discovery um, where uh, if you're familiar with Pedro Murillo, no? Biliarde uh, made the, uh, well, commissioned the map. Um, so we found this in Bologna, again, because of the mapping site. So you'll never know, no? I, once you get access to things, there's so many um, possibilities, right? So the person who contacted me was, again, because she said, oh, you're mapping Philippine chair culture. There's actually this one bamboo tube in Bologna. It's been, it's been, actually, this is on display. It's been there since 1986 when the museum opened, but it is in a very weird museum. It's the medieval museum in Bologna. So who would ever think of having a Philippine object in Bologna in a civil, in a civic medieval museum? Anyway, um, so Caroline actually contacted me because of that, uh, because she saw the mapping site. So 
we went there and studied it and created a digital exhibit. No? So um, what are the features? What, what, did, what kind of technical um, kind of features can you do for a digital exhibit? You can, um, for example, um, uh, using just photos, you can zoom in or you can create really close up of, of, the, of the exhibits. So you could do a slideshow. That's very easy to do. Um, you could, um, so you can put as many, this is actually a slideshow. There's one, there's one um, slideshow, but there's so many photos under, no? So you could, somebody could just keep going forward and seeing all the photos. You can also um, even create a 3D scan um, uh, of an object and embed it in your digital exhibit. And, and this is, for us, we, we thought this would be really good because um, um, it's hard to see kind of the, the thing, no? The, the, the kind of, and how did we do this 3D scan? We actually, uh, I use my phone. There's a, an app called Trinio. Um, I was there in the museum and I just went around the object using a phone. And, and Trinio is actually, it's, it's very cheap. You can, you can download it. It's three dollars, I think, and you can. Um, I went around the object in the museum in Bologna and then uploaded it, and it became a three D scan of the object. So I didn't need anything. So if in the digital exhibit you can um, kind of go around. Of course, it's you know that it's not like super high resolution, but it kind of just gives you an idea of. Um, of what it looks like if you if you turn it around. No? Now, if you look at this, this is a this is just on Sketchfab, which is again a, a free kind of um, site that you can upload your three D scans into. No, so you can you know you can full screen it. You can um, um, you can full screen it, or you can uh, go to Sketchfab. Let's see if it goes in there. Oh no. That's Sketchfab, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so that's the bamboo tube. Let's see if it goes in. Yeah, I'll learn how to fix it here. But this actually keeps going anyway. You just need to take this out, I think. But um, yeah, so, you know, you can imagine if you had, um, you can imagine if you had something in your museum that you could, you could, that could benefit with a 3D scan if it's like in the round and then you you just embed it in your 3D in your um, digital exhibit yeah so that's oops sorry I'm not sharing it sorry about that ah so you can see so this is the 3D um, this is the digital exhibit with a Murillo uh, map, uh, with the Aurelio bamboo and you know you just have a text and you could put in as many pictures as you want and then this is the 3D scan uh, and then we have a text about provenance you know why was it sent to Bologna so this is basically just telling a story of the objects that you want to you know highlight so so yeah so here is the text detail. So this is one thing you can do. You could easily add pictures. And then this is a picture of the bamboo where it is uh, here. Uh, it's all with, with all these different objects. And then, you know, um, you can insert pictures pretty easily in the tour. And this is the slideshow that I was talking about. So. You can put in as many pictures as you want and people can scroll through it. And then of course the footnotes, okay? And then share, <laughs> which is important, right? Uh, I don't know if this will work, but let's see if it works. Um, yeah, so very easy to share on social media. Um, uh, you could just connect it and then people can go to it, right? So that's pretty, I think that's very important, especially uh, for uh, for the Philippine audience, uh, because you know, um, and Twitter. I haven't connected that to Twitter yet, but <laughs> anyway, 
All right, so that's what um, an exa another example of a digital exhibit. And then let's go back to here. Um, this is the bamboo tube. Now, there are other ways of visualizing for the front end. No, you can, uh, you can do all sorts of other things. The beauty of, of Omega is that you can embed a lot of other free tools that you can find online, and th that will make it easy to, um, to do. Uh, for example, you could do um, Timeline, which is another free tool that you can use, and then you just embed. No? Um, we can talk about that a bit more, but this one especially is what I really like now. It's called Story Maps. Um, and the, the, the good thing about this is that unlike, for example, the, the grave markers uh, story, we had to code a little bit to make it look nice. No, we had to code a little bit. So you need to know a little bit of coding for the for it to look nice. Um, but uh, for story maps, um, it's it's really uh, drag and drop in some sense, and I can show show it to you. So for example, I'm uh, working on a story uh, on story maps uh, on um, Jose Rizal's collection in Germany, no? the, the objects that he donated to the German museums uh, in Berlin and Dresden. So I, I was trying to experiment it so that um, my intern can actually, instead of coding uh, a little bit, I, I wanted it to be really kind of easy to do um, at, without much supervision. So um, I found story maps and you can download this, um, uh, you can download and it's really easy. I just did this uh, today. <laughs> uh, so you, you just put the title, etc., and then you can put the text. Uh, so I'll show I'll show it briefly, so you can uh, see um, how easy it is. Um, so. Um, so this is story maps. Um, so you can see that um, you can create a theme. Oh, and the beauty of, of story of story maps at Omega is that um, you can create your own theme so that um, you can embed this in your site and then um, your um, the colors and everything will 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 sync with your your front end, your interface, no? So it doesn't look like it's a separate, uh, it's a separate site. So what I did here is um, I created my own uh, theme. So I created my own theme, uh, you know, with the same colors and the same kind of font, right? And then I created a story using that theme here. So if I look at this one, you can go up here and edit the story. So, so there you can, you know, drop a picture, you can change, you can swivel if you want, you can make it smaller. So, you know, if you're very, if you want it to look good, you can kind of um, play around with it. In the design, you can look at, you can change the top, the bottom or you I kind of like this card look rather than the top but you can like if you if you did that then it's see it just becomes re really easy to do um so it depends you I just um added this no and again this photo is already the data is already in the in the omega site the database so I just um calling the photo and of course I had to ask permission and all that so so that everything in the Omega site in the mapping site we already have permission to use so um, um, then it's it's not like you have to go ask for permission and stuff like that so um, I kind of like this one better and then um, you can go down and you can put in a text right so you can for example here, 
So if you look at this, you can, uh, if you edit, uh, you can edit, you can save. So if you're familiar with WordPress or other things like that, then it's really basically kind of WordPress templates. And you can, um, you know, change change the orientation. You can make it go up. You can do all sorts of things like that. But the important thing is that you have a text, right? You have this text, you have the photos, and then you have the objects that you want to talk about, right? So if you look at this one, you just, um, you can see here, text, you can add a button and the button I actually custom, we kind of made it the same as the mapping site. And then you can put a separator. So this is the separator. You can put a code in, you can put an image. So yeah, it's really kind of easy. You browse, you upload, you can link to it. Of course, here the link to the, to the inventory, you know, because remember, this is an outside uh, tool that you're going to invent. So here you can you can add a, a photo very easily. You can upload, browse from your file. Um, you know, dressed in, let's see. Okay, so you can, so this is dressed in, um, but you kind of don't want it. Well, you can if you want, you can add a caption. So this is the Dresden Museum that he, you can change it to that way. So you can, you can see how, how quickly you can do it, no? Um, you can add more text, you can add a separator, um, you can even add an image gallery. And for an image gallery, you can have a lot of different um, pictures and it will create an image gallery, like the way here like the app, no? So it's very easy. You can even put video, you can put audio, uh, you can make a timeline. So I haven't I haven't tried this yet, but um, you can create a timeline. And when when you do the timeline, you, you can, um, it will look at um, the description and then you just add, you know, event, time, date, et cetera. And then you can you can do that. So, so and then you can create a slideshow. This I like a slideshow. So you know you just drag slides to reorder. You have a sidecar here, and you add all the photos. You upload the photos. You click on this and add the photos. You can even add a background, etc. No, but you can you can you can see uh, what it's like. Uh, uh, you can play around with it. Now, the cool thing about this is that you can um, embed this in your mapping, in the mapping site or in the site that you're making. So for example, here, no one, so here, this is now the mapping site. If you look at this, so it's not like it's gonna say story maps. <laughs> If you're going to use story map because it's free online, it will say story maps, right? When you create something, um, you, when you create something, um, then it will be, um, you know, uh, it will say story maps, et cetera. And it, it's not going to look very nice. So, but you can uh, embed it by, by just, um, you can actually, uh, you can uh, get the code. And I can show you where to get the code. And then you can embed it in your database. So you what basically I can show you, um, I'll show you how it was embedded. Um, so I, I use simple pages. So I did this. I didn't put, I didn't want to put a title uh, because it this already has a title. And this is basically the embed code. If you look at the, the the code, that's basically the embed code, you know. So it goes directly to the iframe in story maps. And then and you can copy this code by uh, downloading it from story maps. And then you basically uh, you know copy and paste it here and you save changes and then save changes. 
And then if you go to the public site, it's, this is still private. You can see, well, this is the, where the title is. I don't know how to take that out, but <laughs> um, anyway, this is now story maps, but it's already inside the shell of your mapping site. So that's very cool, I think. And then, you know, you keep adding to it. So it's very easy. You can keep adding, adding, and then about the author, et cetera. Ooh, maybe you can take that out. Yeah, oh, well, maybe you should just say, maybe you can take that out. But anyway, that's what it, uh, and you know, um, of course, you can connect everything. Um, you could create a timeline, and each each item can connect to the timeline. So all sorts of things like that, right? Um, okay. I'm going back to this one now. So. Um, yeah, I think I will end there. It's 4.01, I mean, 4.01 a.m. <laughs> it's um, an hour already, I think. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I'll end there with the slide. So you can, um, sorry. So this is my email um, um, at Philippine Studies at SOAS. We do workshops in setting up Omega databases. And we, we, work, we have workshops for creating metadata also to customize your metadata and also set up uh, low cost uh, server spaces for people who are interested in it. Uh, so um, email me um, if you are interested. And we, if, you know, if we have enough people, maybe four or five people, uh, we can uh, put together a workshop and then create, um, you know, go step by step. We go through creating the, the Excel sheet with your, your data. We customize the metadata. Then we um, align it with Dublin Core and any other fields. And then you upload the Excel sheet if you have an Excel sheet. Or you could add item by item manually. And then after that, you, you know, create. Um, so I'll just I'll just. Uh, I'll just very quickly show you the site again so you can um, um, so the mapping site um, so so th this is the front end right and all of the back end of this is data right so here we use the mapping coordinates here, it's just a blog. This is the simple pages, just a blog post. And then we have the, these are the exhibits, the digital exhibits. You can feature an item, right? And then these are just kind of essays about in conversation that we do. But this one is really popular, this this particular digital exhibit. I think this, this gets like 200 hits um, a day. <laughs> um, are you looking at the same screen? This oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. So yeah, so this is um, I'm just showing you the um. Sorry about that. Uh, so this these are the possibilities for digital visualization, you might call, which is really kind of the equivalent of a digital exhibit, right? The visualizations that you are keep that that your data is capable of of producing right so the map you could do um you know you can feature certain things you can have a blog uh easily using simple pages you can have murillo and then these are the, the exhibits right you can feature an item in your in your uh website the front end uh what's on view that's the feature that we were talking about the new feature um this one is the one sorry i did wasn't showing it but this is uh the, i think this is the famous the most famous a uh, digital exhibit that we have online and uh yeah oh, as i said almost 200 but then again you, as you see this is um connected to your database right and then you have text you have text you have 
quotes and different things. You can have a slideshow. Oops, it's not working to do that one. But there's a lot of pictures there. Um, again, this 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 connects to the show, to the British Museum where you find it, right? So all of the all of the provenance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that goes in there. And then you tell the stories, you have all these stories, right? All the stories. This is an old picture of the Penn Museum. So yeah, you can just kind of um, catalog number. This one is interesting. It has a lot of provenance, actually, really interesting. Um, it's a Smithsonian. And then you go back and notes, etc. And then as I showed before, you explore items in the exhibit. Yeah, this needs more. Anyway, I'll end there. And if you have questions. Okay, thank you so much for that very informative uh, talk, Christina. So that's uh, very much appreciated. No? for our participants this uh, morning. So uh, we are now um, open for questions. So if you have questions, you can uh, type it in in our chat box. Okay. So let's start with the one on the board uh, we have from FM Nolasco. Mm -hmm. So um, he's asking, what is the app for capturing the object in 3D scan format? Uh, yeah, so the 3D scan that I use, of course, there are many other uh, formats, no? But the one that I use is Trinio. So it's called, I know, I write it down. Which one do I, who do I use? Chat. D-R-N-I-O. Oh, chat, yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, to everyone. So it's called Trinio. Yeah. Um, and you can download it onto your phone. It's T R N I O. T R I N I O. Trinio. Okay. Now, of course, there are other. Uh, no, no, you can use other more expensive equipment, and you, there are some. Some iPhones can actually do lighter scanning already, on it as well. So, but this is the one that's. It's really easy to use as well, and it goes. It creates a a a video um, right away after yeah 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 so this yeah. training works on uh iphone only or um no i other... think it works on android uh android as well all right so mm. uh thank you next question um uh, i'm curious what are the chances or likelihood of a museum's online platform help in locating related objects from other parts of the world uh, who usually share this information with you? Okay, there are two questions. First, what are the chances or likelihood of a museum's online platform help in locating related objects from other parts of the world? And the second question is, who usually share this information with you? Is it a regular museum uh, goer or fellow museum professionals or academics? Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So the first question, um, as as I was saying, no, um, there's so many possibilities once people have access to where things are <laughs> and what they are, uh, and and it's pretty simple. The the database is pretty simple, no. It's it's just an aggregation of the data that museums give to us, or we ask for, or or bargain for, <laughs> um. And the likelihood is 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 has been from experience really very interesting. Um, I I get all sorts of emails. I we do have a we do have a, a share button uh, here. Well, this is the back end, pala, so I log out. But if um, you can um, go to the contribute page, and you can um, either contribute or contact. So we, we get a lot of just random people, um, mostly, uh, um, well, some in the Philippines who just want to go online and look for the stuff or 
a lot of the times also it's been somebody in Spain, for example, is who's like just just today I've been like um just today I was texting Christy who's in Madrid and then um she was saying, Oh, there's this small museum, uh, and there's all these Philippine objects, no one has cataloged them, etc. So do you want me to connect you to the curator? You want me to take pictures of it? And and so yeah, very random. And of course, they they're objects that you know that's kind of like what the bamboo tube and in, in Bologna, for example. So as long as people kind of know that this project is ongoing, perhaps if you're a regional museum and and they know that you have an online presence, and there's a way to contact you and um, and have access to uh, digital access to your inventory. Um, yeah, there's so many possibilities. And the people, yeah, as I was saying, a regular museum goer, it, it it's um it doesn't you don't have to be a professional uh, or an academic. You just have to be curious and you know willing to share um uh what you find so that others can see it and can have access to it. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I think for the the second question, this is already answered. So mm -hmm. uh, usually it's the curators or directors of the museum who would uh, share this information to the project. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next question is uh, maybe Sharon Bulaklak is asking if there's like a cost for the uh, Omeka software. Omega app for uh, creating this database or the other question is the registration for this upcoming workshop. So uh, first, uh, this webinar is intended for the participants of the level three uh, museum training. And uh, yes, you're most welcome to attend, but we have to assess if you are really uh, running a museum for, uh, for now, because uh, this is for the HEI um, museums no, and the targeted uh, participants for this uh, year three level okay cost for omeka um would would they be paying cost like subscription subscription fees for the omeka um, use for the database oh for the database no it's free online you you can um download it the only thing is and that's why we do workshops um generally which at, at, at SOAS, we, we do it for free. But, um, you know, as, as Ikin was saying, um, uh, you know, we need to put together a good group who were actually going to do something with it. Um, but uh, if you download Omega, it's free. The only thing is the server space. Now, mm -hmm. servers, because you need to configure the server space. And that's why we do workshops to go through it step by step. But Omeka actually also has a, a free space that you can try. They call a sandbox. Um, if you go to Omeka Classic, um, you can um, just play around with it, uh, play with the theme, you know, configure the, the photos, put in some photos. Um, I, uh, it's in the, wait, huh? let me see. Uh, this is, you can, you can download, you can, Look at the manual here. Uh, wait, uh, I'll put it on the chat to see. If, um, um, yeah, you can. I'll put it on the chat, and you can. Um, um, and then yeah. you can you can download the YouTube video uh, to mm -hmm. show you step-by-step step how it's done. And I have to look for that free sandbox that they provide for students or for, for you, for first time users, you can have a free sandbox. Um, um, I'm not sure if I can find it now, but I'll, I'll look for it. Um, yeah, as I, as I answer questions, but I'll try to look for it. Okay, so uh, yeah. there's a question from, a related question from Abe 
received from Ateneo de Davao. What are the what was the initial partnership with SOAS PH studies with another overseas museum for digital repatriation? Like, uh, did SOAS initiate the partnership? Uh, usually, what does the partner museum ask from SOAS PH studies besides sharing digital counterpart of their collection? Ah, uh, so uh for for digital repatriation uh so um so we make a distinction between digital uh digital access and digital repatriation just uh, just as a i don't know so when we talk of digital access we go to um an overseas museum uh like like the british museum or whoever and we talk to the curator the copyright uh you know holder and we ask for their data and we tell them, you know, this is our project. So I have a standard letter and we, we try to convince them that, you know, we need to give access to people for this, um, for these objects, etc. And and more, more often than not, I mean, I've never been refused. Um, some are slow in giving it because uh, some of them have not photographed their um, inventory, their Philippine materials, but most of them give it to us. Um, and then we just, you know, they just have very specific copyright, like you, you need to cite the copyright and all these things in the in the database, no? And then, of course, you link back to the museum or to the object if it's online in the other museum. So it kind of drives traffic also to their um, online uh, inventory, you know? So... So yes, I usually go and ask, get the curator's name, and I initiate the partnership. Um, but with digital repatriation, there's an extra step because in digital repatriation, as we define it, we uh, print the high resolution photos. We usually ask for really close up, very big high resolution ones so we can put it like in a poster. And then we, because we're printing it and it's not online, we ask for 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 um, extra permission because, uh, yeah, because it we're kind of printing it, no. So I so for digital repatriation, we we with the plan, for example, we went to um, the Field Museum and they've been very good. They they said yes, of course. They gave us they make got really close up pictures at very high resolution, so we were able to have really nice posters. And this is the one that we bring back to the source community. Um, usually they choose from the mapping site online, they choose what kind of photos they want. And then they use it actually, we, we sometimes we frame it for them and they can put it there, et cetera. No? But, um, so that's digital repatriation, but just for digital access, uh, yeah, I initiate the, I initiate the, uh, you know, I liaise with the people who were um, in charge of copyright and, and stuff. Some museums actually um, don't even really care about, um, because all of it is what they call creative commons. So if it's more creative commons, then you don't need to worry about it because when you write to them, they say, oh, that's fine. You can like creative commons museums are like the Met Museum in New York. You don't need to have specific um, specific permission to even just digital access, not even digital repatriation. Also digital repatriation, no no need to per permission. You can even use it for commercial purposes because usually we say, you know, we're not using this for commercial purposes. We're not even, um, we're even very careful with data, you know, GDPR here, uh, you know, data. We don't harvest data for our users. Uh, so we don't use um third-party cookies, for example, in the mapping site, because th then that's another layer of, you know, because people can monetize that, make uh, have commercial use for it. So here in the mapping site, at least, we don't uh, put cookies. Um, and we use um, Matomo Analytics, so not Google Analytics, because Google Analytics, again, is a third-party thing, and that can become an issue with museums who don't want you to... Um, monetize the the site because with Google Analytics uh, you know they can sell the data of the users so we don't want that so those are kind of the things that we kind of assure the museums whose data we're using that you know um, it's 
for pure research uh, for, for ed, uh, educational use. Um, what you what does he the partner ask from SOAS? Okay, so what they ask from us is um, usually nothing. Uh, some museums, um, because uh, some museums require a memorandum of agreement, like the uh, the Peabody Museum in Harvard. Uh, when we signed an agreement, they asked for um, a yearly report of what we annotated in our in uh, in the mapping site. So whatever we change or whatever we added, etc., we are uh, to give a, a report uh, a, once a year. And this is mainly because they want to change their um, their data as well. Um, uh, because you know museums are online they they always want people to engage with it and if they can do it as, as with us as mediator i guess uh that the, they want that um um aside from sharing um yeah that's pretty much it really most of them they just give the data and then we use it um yeah what okay. kind of copyright oh yeah go ahead Sorry. Yeah. What kind yeah. of copyright issues uh, may arise for this type of open access uh, digital archives, especially for the Philippine setting? Mm. Um, yeah, um, I guess I guess what um, for the Philippines, um, it really depends on your user. I think like who you're creating the database for. Um, if if the owning institution is okay with sharing it as open access, it's it's for me it's fine. Um, if you are a regional museum and you're kind of worried about the images being used by others, you could watermark it if you want. But in terms of our use in the mapping site, we haven't really had any um, copyright issues. Uh, Mostly because we we make sure we cite the source, and then we link back to the owning institution, and we also um, we also uh, yeah we we cite it very clearly that where the where the object is. Uh, okay. Can't think of any other yeah copyright issue. Yeah. Related yeah. question from Mary Grace Perez. Uh, yeah. Since Omeka is a web pl uh, publishing platform, how often how often is the the updates and maintenance of the system to ensure security data and technology yeah. compatibility? Yeah, so that's um so Omeka has been around for almost twenty years already. So, in terms of um you know uh. And it's open source, so you can see kind of the 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 structure of the of the coding, you no, know, for Omega. And um, in terms of plugins and updates, that's why we recommend a server space that has Omega. Um, uh, Omega, uh, what do you call this? Uh, support. So we use a a server that has um, kind of. Um, a good a good um kind of technical knowledge of omega and it's not expensive the servers for example here we pay 80 a year 80 pounds a year so um it's very doable price i think and when we um when we ask them questions or we ask them for update to update certain things they're very quick no because we use um something called reclaim hosting um, I'm sure you can um, kind of maybe find maybe some somewhere in the Philippines that might have that or even here, you know, it's it's pretty easy to set up something uh, here uh, in the UK and use it in the Philippines um, as well. Okay, I have a, a few uh, some questions here from sure. Ms. Velasco. Are there projects in mapping living traditions by SOAS? Uh, number two, do you suggest adopting the same format for such database? And then apart from adding audio and video, what other data may be utilized to perhaps link up practitioners to scholars and the global audience from Mr. Nolasco? Um, 
Um, so kung living tradition, meaning um, something that is not static, no, it's like ongoing. Yes. Um, um, I think I think um, the digital exhibit, you can, I mean, you can do kind of um, non tem oh, well, um, yes, yeah, so you were saying video or audio. Um, I'm trying to think of how, I, I guess you could connect it like live streaming. You can embed live streaming things um, in the Omega site. I mean, it's very embeddable. Um, but I do think like, in terms of kind of the baseline for your data, like what, what's what been there, or what traditionally has been there and how is it moving along or how is it changing? Um, it would be good still to have like a static, the static data historically, you know, as you trace kind of the transformations of it. Um, in, in some sense, that's why we, um, for example, when we um, annotate the data in the mapping site, we actually do not erase the original uh, data. Uh, you know, whenever we annotate, we, we retain for historical or for research purposes, we, just, we retain it and then we um, show the annotated one and put the date on it. So you can kind of create uh, kind of a sequence uh, or a kind of, um, yeah, a, like kind of kind of like a timeline of your annotation. So I can imagine a uh, living tradition being the same way. You could probably use timelines um, as a as a as a digital exhibit as well um, to to show transformation. We we do use a lot of um, uh, well, we're trying to use a lot of videos as well because I think um, that also really. Um, but as I as 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 I was saying, I think it's important that there's a shell, there's a repository of everything that's kind of stable and um, easily findable. Because I think that's the key for a database, right? You you need to be able to find something in all the data that you have. And you need to be able to use individual items for visualizations. Um, otherwise, parang, there's no use in a database, no? There's no... Yeah. yeah. So there's a question from Mild Hombre Bueno. Uh, mm -hmm. So she wanted to follow up whether Omega Classic, if there is a limit for the storage of pictures or videos uh, mm -hmm. in using the Omega. Yeah. So for pics, it's, it's pretty it's pretty big, the storage capacity. Uh, videos is a bit more um, problematic because, well, you can embed videos so that it's on youtube and then you embed the video right so you don't you don't necessarily um you don't uh take up any of the storage space because you're connecting to an outside server and, and youtube is free um the only problem with youtube is and that's why we don't use it so much is that it it has again third-party cookies and that could be a problem for for some of the institutions. So there is um, uh, uh, there is um, kind of a technology called FMPEG, which is uh, it's able to stream. Um, it's kind of complicated to do, but we're we're actually trying to do this with um, one of our databases. We're we're helping set up uh, on decolonizing um, Southeast Asian sound archives. And they have a lot of videos, but it needs to be converted to FMPEG and um, so that it streams, but it calculates kind of the bandwidth of your, and, and it, it won't go up to YouTube. You don't need to put it up on YouTube. It could just be on a server. But yeah, there is a limit to the, to the, to the to the uh, server space, of course. So, as much as possible, the videos, especially are the ones that are take up a lot of space. So you need to kind of format it so that it it doesn't take up too much space. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question from uh, Miss Nalasco. Are there projects in mapping living traditions uh, by SOAS? Do you suggest adopting the same formal format for such database? And the second uh, question is, apart from adding 
audio and video, what other data may be utilized uh, to link up practitioners to scholars and the global audience? Oh, I think um, we answered that already, no? Okay. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, All right, I'll just... Kenny is sleepy. <laughs> I'm a bit sleepy trying to wake up. Okay, so... <laughs> Yeah, okay, so see. I think the rest are okay. So there's uh from UP Rosa Bombales from UP Los Baños, uh mm -hmm. regarding uh the generation of report. Does Omeka provide Excel format? Omeka, um, yes. yes, you can uh generate um you can generate this uh link from this link. You can generate um. Uh, an Excel sheet, but you have to be the one to, of course, add, add it on, no? Yeah. You can go to this spreadsheet. It's like a template with all this um, collection builder, for example, for metadata. And then you could, you could of course, change no, the, 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 the columns. You know, if you have file name, you have creator, etc. cetera. But um, yeah. You can use that as a template. So that template will need to be synced up with the fields that ha that are there in Met in Omega, and then you can upload, and it will automatically create the items. Right. Okay. There's a question about sustainability of this uh, platform. Like, uh, will it still work after ten? I mean, ten years from now or five years from now? Uh, yeah. Since technology is, I mean, very fast to yeah. uh, change, no, in terms yeah. of its uh, life. Yeah, <laughs> Chat GPT. <laughs> They'll oh, probably be doing all the website. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, Omega has been around for a while, uh, but I think the kind of good thing about this, um, I know, platform is that um, you can download your data. You can download your Excel sheet, which is kind of really the backbone, no? Mm -hmm. And you can once you once you have this, uh, you because you can download it, you can share it. Then you will always have your 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 bones. <laughs> and then um, if you could, maybe there'll be another platform you can upload it there again. Just kind of you know kind of recalibrate some of the columns, etc. If there's another platform, but. Um, the key is that you have your Excel sheet. It's it's good data. It's it's very rich data, and yeah, the platform is something that it can can come and go. Although, from experience, um, Omega has been around for 20, 20 years now. So I think um, and it's, it's I think it's kind it's of an upgrading. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's Omega Classic and there's the yeah. new version. Right. Um, others. Yeah. Okay. And then also this Omeka isn't um it's 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 not a, like a nonprofit it open source thing. It's not like you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Flash and how all the projects that were done using Flash because Apple started saying, you know, we, we're not gonna use Flash anymore. So all those projects kind of just disappeared. But at least with Omeka, it's not like a it's not like a private company, so it's like a consortium of of nonprofits and schools who put it together. So they have a bit more stake in you know freedom and access. Yeah, I think my last question is: mm -hmm. so uh, we've seen the rep repatriation being done uh, mm -hmm. for the Tibeti um, artifacts. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering, for instance, in terms of access in um indigenous communities for instance in cordillera in in mindanao mm. uh mm. without internet connection for instance but they wanted to you know learn more about yeah uh, their, their own artifacts their their cultural ethnographic artifacts how mm -hmm. can this mapping culture project can address uh in terms of public access and uh public reach for instance yeah. 
Yeah, so we have actually been kind of able to um, have some small research grants that SOAS gives. Uh, we have been trying actually hard to actually do the, the kind of digital repatriation where we go to the source communities, we bring the posters, we have a conversation around it, the posters and kind of these objects, and then annotate the material, the mapping site. So in that sense, of course, it, you know, it takes a lot of um, some resources, etc. But um, it can be done, you know, um, we also try to reach um, the diaspora here in in the UK, for example, um, and where we we um, try to arrange um, kind of object handling, like with the British Museum or, or stuff like that. But um, yeah, you do need to, um, especially for source communities in the Philippines. Parang, although I'm kind of surprised sometimes we were in the, the Talaandig in Bukidnon just recently, and um, they were using the mapping site on their phones, uh, the elders. In fact, they were like, I was showing them the posters and they were like zooming in with their phone, like, uh, you know, taking and zooming in so they could see the stitch that was being used in the, you know, in the poster. So you never know. I mean, Facebook, I mean, on the Philippines, um, a lot of them are online. Uh, I mean, you know, it depends, of course. But um, yeah, I guess you just have to be very um, kind of, um, you just need to be really aware of how you can make the archive as a site of engagement um, for people as much as possible and kind of always push for um, not just digital access, but kind of actual access. Okay, thank you so much, Christina. Sure. Um, um, there will be a training on the Omeka in, uh, I think, July or in August, no? So we will have Dr. Wan uh, teach us uh, the steps now how to do um, your database uh, using the Omeka um, platform. No? So we also would like to request our participants to prepare all the materials uh, needed for um, the creation. No? For instance, the Excel files, um, object lists no, are, are already in, on the Excel file and other information. Um, okay. So uh, I think we finish all the questions for now. So any last words or messages for our uh, participants? It's already 4 a.m. Uh, 4 a.m. for 37. Um, oh, nothing. Uh, it was it was great. Um, I'm always so excited about what might what might might happen from from sharing with this. I've seen a lot of really good work coming out of. Um, you know, sharing our experience with the mapping site, and hopefully, yeah, you can do something with it with it talk. Okay, so thank okay. you so much, Doctor Wan, for sharing your time at this uh, hour, and then of course your <laughs> your project on the mapping uh, material culture. So we thank everybody uh, to our participants. Please don't forget to. Uh, fill in the uh, evaluation feedback for this talk uh, to get your certificates for attending this webinar. Thank you so much and have a good day. Good night. Pala dito. Good night. So yeah, trying to wake up. Thank you. I think see you and have a good night. Good morning. Okay. Thank you. So to our participants, uh, I hope we have a lot of takeaway lessons from the webinar uh, this morning. And uh, now it's up to you to prepare the um, materials needed for the upcoming training uh, in Baguio City um, scheduled in July, uh, last week of July. So uh, we would like you to prepare all the, the materials required. Uh, first, the inventory or object list then uh, it should be in the Excel file, uh, the photos and other museum information that should that you want to include in your uh, museum website using the Omeka. Now, uh, for the Omeka, there are some hosting um, 
uh, requirements uh, that will be needed, uh, which uh, your university can provide. No, you have to consult your IT office regarding this, whether the, the you have the hosting capacity and your da data management plan. No, so yun yung mga importanting points that you have to uh, look into. So okay, so we uh, that's our second webinar for May. Uh, we will have uh, the last, I think, webinar on May thirty first uh, with Mr. Kobe Kayabiab. He will talk about three D virtual tours. No, um, the relevance of this with a case study of the uh, Museo Cordillera and other uh, related museums in the Philippines. Okay, so we thank everybody. Hindi pa di group photo to no Rose. Rose? Ah, okay. So it's okay. Uh, so thank you, everybody. See you again on May 31, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Bye.